Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story is, if management orders you to stop checking that box as the raw materials are full, they can't be surprised when they're empty. The second story, captain is super rude and entitled when my dad tries to help, so he complies, which screws the captain over into a big fine. The third story, I worked hard but my boss said I was doing unnecessary work, so I stopped doing a lot of work. The first story is, if management likes a mystery, then so do I. I worked in a plastics extrusion plant. We made grain bags and greenhouse covers and garbage bags and all sorts of thin plastic SH. Hundreds of thousands of pounds of it in a month. All of it came from little plastic pellets the size of a small pea. Different companies made differently composed pellets that did different things. They were all mixed, melted, turned into a 7-story tall 60-foot wide bubble, cooled and folded and rolled at around 50 feet per minute. Thanks to previous management not being D's, we also had a good union contract. So good that we got paid when the power was out, when the machines were broken. Didn't matter. If the plant wasn't on a planned shutdown, we come to work, even if nothing's working. And these giant machines that did all the work had to be specially shut down when they closed the plant. If you just turned them off and left, the plastic inside would harden, and you had to completely dismantle them and ship it apart piece by piece. It took weeks of 24-7 work. But a full shutdown and startup took around a week when done properly. So they would avoid shutting down and sending us home. Cheaper to pay us to sit. Great gig. Anyways, part of my gig was taking inventory. A giant warehouse with hundreds of 1 meter 3, about a 4 by 4 by 4 foot cube, 1 ton boxes filled with these various little plastic pellets. Almost all of them look exactly the same, save a different number on each type. And of course the empty boxes were stored here too. Close packed rows of everything. They usually brought in enough for a few weeks worth of work, but for some of the more special stuff that could just be a box or two. So you'd have to get out of the forklift, climb through the stacks, banging on the boxes to make sure they're not hollow, because some moron on night shift threw empties in the wrong spot, or was trying to F with the new guys by tricking them into fetching empty boxes. One particular day we were short-handed and the boss, the big guy in the office who doesn't know SH, ordered me to bust hump on the inventory and get back to the line. So I'm going at it, climbing around as best as I can, when the boss comes hustling in looking to murder me. He tears into me for being out of the forklift and effing around. I explained I have to check the numbers on all the boxes, because sometimes they're messed up. He insists he can see the numbers just fine. I point out that you have to check to make sure the boxes are full. He yells that if we don't F up that won't matter. I counter that if he wanted an F up free crew, he worked for the wrong company. Things went downhill from there. I was a bit of an SH disturber at that place. Loved it. After a bit of being, I got him to issue a new work procedure in writing, that inventory should now be done from inside the forklift by driving by these six deep stacks, three high, packed pretty close together, looking at whatever box happened to be closest, and assuming the entire row was full of boxes of exactly the same type. It went exactly as well as you think it did. Soon enough mystery boxes starting appearing in rows, things got messed up, and one night some poor new F who was only allowed to drive forklift got f in the A. He'd bring in a box, put it on the loading station, and the guy on the floor would open up an empty box and scream at him to get an effing full one. He'd dutifully return to the proper row, pick up a box, bring it back and have it be an empty. By the time he dug up a full one it was too late. The line ran low and had to be shut down. One by one they died over the weekend, as it turned out we were woefully out of stock on a few key components. Management walking in on Monday morning to a quiet plant and a well-rested night shift waving cheerfully goodbye was a sight that warmed my heart. Sitting on his desk was a stack of every shift's inventory reports, stapled to a copy of the work procedure, and a signed note from our union chair, reminding the boss he couldn't take action against us for doing what he told us to do. In an exciting double feature of postscript action, one of the vital components we got came from pretty far away by rail, and thanks to a natural disaster between us, shipping was delayed. We all sat around idling the machines, essentially getting paid to watch movies, order pizza, and occasionally push a button unless it was your turn to sleep, for a week before they got desperate and paid to have the stuff trucked up. Same day long hauling a week's worth of that stuff would cost a mint. I think in a week we could get through 50 tons easy, so the vacation was nice. And in a personal moment of triumph, as we had a company-wide meeting with all the bigwigs and the boss, discussing how to prevent this and how much it cost, I stood up and suggested just making colored stickers, including bright empty ones. 
Since my previous gig was an office job at an office supply company, I was able to tell them how we could just use our existing label printers and the different colors didn't even cost more than what we were using now. Which by the way was the expensive one. Why the F weren't we using cheap ones for internal labeling? The union chair pipes in that they'd asked for that a while ago and had been turned down by the boss because I don't have time to look at your rainbow SH. Get some effing glasses. The curmudgeonly old timer chimed in with a who the F can afford glasses with our SH benefits. When's our next contract meeting? And the meeting dissolved into the boss looking like SH. The boys having fun piling on, the upper management freaking out that we were going to throw an SH when our contract was up, and a sudden uptick in our working conditions. The second story is... Being extremely rude when I'm trying to help. Enjoy the hefty fine then. So, this happened to my dad in the late 90s and early 2000s. He was a flight engineer, FE, at the time on a Boeing 747. Background. Now, before every takeoff, the FE was supposed to calculate a bunch of stuff took about 8 minutes, for a takeoff at full thrust, and or if the situation was right, less than full. For an extra 30 seconds, my dad would usually just calculate both, and hand the papers to the captain, and they can choose the one they want. No one ever had a problem with this, and most were impressed and grateful, because often they would ask the FE to make the other one anyways. Foreshadowing anyone? The characters. D. My dad. C. The captain. F. O. First officer. Now the main story. C was three months away from retirement and was the most entitled captain my dad had ever flown with up to this point. He quickly realized this when after giving him the two sheets before takeoff, C looks at them and throws full thrust sheet at him in an I'm way better than you peasant, you're just an idiot kind of way. My dad is startled and C says something along these lines. C, do you know the eight things you have to consider when making these calculations? D, yes, it's names them all. C slightly surprised. Well then you should know that I only want the less than full thrust one. Oh and you're still on probation, right? My dad is taken aback by his sudden rudeness and doesn't reply. C. Yeah, you are. Now learn something from this. They were heading to England and C just a massive entitled jerk the whole flight. After an overnight stay it's time to head back. Malicious compliance. Now on most takeoffs the 747 didn't do full thrust. It just saves fuel which saves money and makes the companies operating them happy. London was a different story, however. Without full thrust, the plane wouldn't be able to climb fast enough to avoid triggering the noise sensors on the ground. That would just mean the plane is too low, therefore too loud for the people below, and would then lead to the company getting fined a few thousand dollars. My dad was fully aware of this, but in true malicious compliance fashion, only wrote down the less than full thrust sheet. He gives it to the FO, which then reads it over to make sure everything is correct. He realized my dad's mistake, looks at him, is about to say something but then smiles. F.O. All is correct. C. Smirk smile. C. You do learn. They take off and C is actually almost pleasant on the way back, most likely because he thinks he's won or something stupid like that. After landing and just before getting out of the plane, F.O. says, F.O. Oh and by the way, keep an eye out for the violation in three days time. C. Suddenly on the defensive. What? No. We did everything properly. Nothing went wrong. What are you talking about? F.O. London, we needed full thrust to avoid the noise sensors. I thought you would have known this. C. Realizing the mistake. Face turning pale. But F.O. And with how you treated D, do you really think we would have reminded you? So yeah, you're getting a noise violation. Either because he was the one taking off, or he was the captain so he was the one in charge. So for something like this his license is on the line. Can't remember which one it was in that case. Only C would get a notice. Since my dad was still on probation, he couldn't say anything, so was really happy the FO stepped up. Apparently, C's face was priceless. A mix of hatred, confused defeat. The whole shebang, haha. <laughs> the aftermath. He was known as M, perfect and had his face on many of the company websites and papers. Getting a call from a manager about that was a massive hit to his ego. My dad never got to fly with him before he retired, but it would have been interesting to see if C treated him with more respect or made his life a living hell on future shifts. The last story is... Petty had never tasted so good. So, this time last year I was working at an agency, and I had been working for my highly demanding client for over one and a half years by then. I had already spent a whole pre-COVID year traveling several times a month, while still working 60 plus hour weeks. When the world shut down, I thought my workload would be a lot easier, because our overall team's workload was halted for a few months and I wouldn't need to travel for or plan events. I was very naive. Instead of scaling back our work when everyone else stopped working, 
Our client wanted my team to ramp up our work by planning for the post-pomegranate world. This wouldn't have been as big of a deal if it wasn't for the fact that we all knew this was busy work, and that none of our plans were ever going to be brought to fruition. So we had spent all the summer wasting our time, instead of taking a much needed break, using the time for continued education or reorganizing our team's structure. Come launch time last year, our workload became exponentially harder than it had ever been because we knew how to find alternatives to everything we'd ever done before since we were working in a virtual world. Also around that time, my already incompetent leads had decided to really not try and give all their work to myself and my teammates because we had less work to do since we weren't traveling anymore. My work had gone from 60 plus hour weeks in the summer to 80 plus hour weeks. It got to the point where we would have to sit on 8 hour calls with the client every Friday to do the work that my bosses didn't want to. I even had to still attend calls while my dad was in the hospital. Since this was quickly spiraling out of control, I constantly pushed back because I was getting to the point where I didn't have enough hours in the day to do everything that was asked for all of me. One of my managers eventually called me one evening and basically spent 30 minutes calling me unprofessional, cursing me out and saying that I was lucky to have the job I did. He also stated, I don't even know what you're working on, so you can't say no when I give you new work. I explained to him that he was CC'd on every project request sent to me. We had meetings twice a week to talk about our workload, and I was doing his work on top of that. But he said that doesn't explain why I was working as much as I was, and that it wasn't his job to track my hours. He said that if I wanted to be able to complain about my workload, then it was my responsibility to make sure he knew exactly what I was working on, and for how long I was working on it. So I started tracking my work down to the minute, but I didn't stop there. I also tracked who my requests were coming from. All of them were direct orders from either my bosses or my client. Time wasted on unnecessary calls, delays due to incomplete information from my bosses, and marked which work was done because my bosses didn't want to do the work. After a few weeks, I had a breakdown of every single minute of my very long work days, which clearly showed that my long days were because of my leader's incompetence. I sat on this file until my manager decided to yell at me again a month later, spouting the same I don't even know what you're working for so long, so you must be doing things you're not supposed to. Mind you, I was salaried, so I was not going to waste my own time by doing SH I didn't have to do. So I told him that I'd been tracking my time, and if he wanted to see it, I could send it to him. He smugly told me I'd love to see it, probably expecting to be proven right. I told him I'd send it, and he said he would schedule a call with me after reviewing it, so we can talk through my inefficiencies. So after the call, I sent him the file, and never heard back from him about the file. I did eventually ask him if he wanted me to set up a call to review the file, and he said there was no need to. My workload never got easier, but at least I no longer had to put up with his late evening calls cursing me out. I did end up quitting early this year, and then over the next three months my whole team quit one by one. So I definitely got the last laugh by getting paid more to do less work, and making my bosses scramble to replace a team of seven who they then had to train, while not knowing how to do any of the work. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.